I'm Richard Steenen, industry analyst, author, and welcome to this Security Current podcast. Our guest is Mark Rash, who is our legal editor for Security Current and frequent contributor. And today we wanted to talk to Mark because there's uh, been quite a lot of attention paid to recent uh, FTC action against the chief security officer, uh, former chief security officer of Uber. So let me welcome Mark Rash, who uh, worked in the Justice Department as a trial attorney. Uh, he is uh, currently a uh, lecturer at George Washington University and, of course, an attorney. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Richard. So, Mark, give us the uh, the layout, the rundown of what happened a uh, week All ago right. Thursday, I think. Well, to understand the background, you have to understand the nature of Uber and um, and its data security practices. So, Uber had had a fairly large scale data breach in 2014. Uh, which led to not only class action lawsuits and a data breach notification, but also a Federal Trade Commission investigation. While the FTC was not only investigating the 2014 data breach uh, and negotiating with various people over at Uber about how to settle that, in, 20, in 2016, there was another much larger data breach. This data breach involved records of millions of Uber customers, millions of Uber drivers uh, and involve a large amount of personally identifiable information. The lawyers, the executives, and Joe Sullivan, who was a lawyer, but acting in the capacity of um, chief security officer for Uber during the course of these discussions with the FTC, never disclosed to the FTC the fact that there had been a subsequent data breach. Now, I'll talk a little bit about what he actually did do. But what happened last week is the United States Attorney's Office and Grand Jury in Northern California issued a two-count indictment charging two felonies, uh, uh, charging Joe Sullivan, the Chief Security Officer of Uber, with two felonies. These were one called misprison of a felony and the other one related to obstruction of the Federal Trade Commission investigation. That word misprison was brand new to me. I've added it to my lexicon. Could you describe what that means? Sure. So misprison of a felony is an ancient legal doctrine. And we always see this on television when we watch TV uh, cop procedural shows where they allege that somebody has a legal obligation to report a crime if they know that it's occurring. There is no general legal obligation to report a crime uh, unless you have a special status like you're a law enforcement officer and you're required to do it. But there, is, there are different crimes associated with not reporting a crime. And these can be concealing a crime. These can be aiding and abetting. These can be um, um, uh, criminal facilitation, conspiracy. Those are all things that relate to sort of covering up a crime. Um, it can be, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, something after the fact. I'll, I'll remember that in just a second. Yeah. Misprison is an ancient English common law legal doctrine, which makes it a crime if you have actual knowledge of a felony to conceal and not report that felony. So you have to have knowledge of a crime. That crime has to be a felony. You have to know that it's a felony. You have to not report the felony. And you have to take some active measure to conceal that felony to prevent it from being known. So that's the ancient doctrine of uh, misprison of a felony. So, okay. So Joe Sullivan um, would probably know that a crime had been committed if there had been a, a breach, an attack, right? Um, so, you know, being a former prosecutor himself, he should definitely know that. But I think what what most CISOs out there are going to worry about is, yeah, you know, every attack against us violates the Computer Front, uh, Crimes Act, um, right? It's unauthorized intrusion, uh, theft of either intellectual property or identities, plus all of the privacy regulations. Um, but there are a lot of those going on every single day. I mean, I don't, I don't report 
what happens on my website to anybody. I wouldn't even know how to do that. It's probably criminal. In the past, I've reported crimes that I knew were uh, credit card theft to generate stolen gift certificates for the company I ran. I tried to report it, and the, the Secret Service said, nah, you know, if it's less than 25000 don't even talk to us. So... <laughs> Sure, that number is much higher now, by the way. Is it really? I bet they, it they, they won't touch a computer crime case unless it's over three and a half, three three hundred thousand dollars. Wow, wow. Okay. So, so I, th- I think what you pointed out is actually true. And there's two things you need to, to think about in the Sullivan Uber case. The first one is that this was no ordinary not reporting. Okay, there are lots of crimes that occur that people choose not to report. Um, what Sullivan is alleged to have done, and I think the evidence tends to show this, is in addition to not reporting, he paid these unknown hackers $100,000 to execute a non-disclosure agreement, which, by the way, couldn't be enforced because he didn't even know who they were, Right. essentially buying their silence or, as the, as the charging document calls, paying hush money. Right. Now, there's a difference between not reporting a crime and taking active measures to conceal it and prevent it from being reported. So I think that in the ordinary case, uh, not reporting is not itself a crime. The second thing though, that's a huge misconception that is more concerning is the fact that people have focused on this particular breach because there were data breach disclosure laws. And Sullivan, the general counsel, the CEO of Uber and others chose not to report a data breach for which they were legally obligated to report. For the misprison statute, that's completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether the crime was a crime that you were required to report or not required to report. The misprison statute makes it a crime to not report any felony, whether you committed it, whether you aided and abetted it, or whether you are the victim of it, provided that you conceal and fail to report it. And I think that goes to your point, uh, Richard, which is companies are victims of computer crimes on a continuous basis, whether it is a pen test, a ping sweep, a port scan, a uh, a phishing attempt, a successful phishing attempt, an unsuccessful phishing attempt, uh, anything like this. Each one of those is a felony. Every piece of malware, every DDoS, every every uh, attempted penetration is a felony. Every insider who steals information. Even, even worse than that, any insider who exceeds the scope of their authorization to use the computer is a felony. Wow. Any any potentially any user uh, or subscriber who violates terms of use or terms of service is feloniously accessing in excess of their authorization and therefore committing a felony. Wow. Okay. So felony computer crimes occur hundreds of thousands of times a minute. Now the felony, the, the misprison of a felony statute makes it a crime for anyone with actual knowledge of the felony to conceal and not report. So we have a felony happening thousands of times a day. We have a non-reporting of that felony. Why? Because we dismiss them as incidents. And the only question we have is if a CISO or somebody below a CISO does anything to actively conceal that felony, no matter how trivial the felony is, they run the risk of having liability under the statute. Wow. So in the case, in this particular case, it's a breach disclosure uh, requirement because there was a breach. You're required in every, practically every state in the union to disclose that. And every got, state now. Yeah, every state. Yep. Um, but there's no federal law that requires that. So why is the FTC the one bringing the charges? Well, the FTC isn't bringing the charges. The charges are being brought by the United States Attorney's Office in California uh, and by the federal grand jury. So the FTC has a unique relationship with this. I want to point out a couple of things about the breach disclosure laws. Yes, there are breach disclosure laws, but they do not have criminal penalties. And yet we are making the failure to 
disclose a breach into a crime, right. which it isn't. So we're, what we're doing is we're piggybacking using the misprison statute, creating effectively a federal crime of failing to uh, adhere to a breach disclosure law. Okay, right. not failing so to disclose. That's, that's number one. The huge escalation in everybody's concern. Right. But yeah. the one caveat I want to add to this, and it's important, again, not doing a breach disclosure is not a crime. But if you add to that some element of concealment, and we're not sure how much of an element of concealment there is, that becomes a crime. And one of the interesting things that happens is in a breach, one of the things may happen is the lawyers, myself included, will say, I want to take control of this investigation, whether it's inside counsel or outside counsel, because we don't want, we want to control the flow of information. So the act of telling people report the breach to me as counsel, because we want to cloak it with privilege may be considered by the justice department to be an act of concealment, making the whole investigation a felony. Just just as would be the, you know, the email that goes out to all the people who've touched the uh, investigation, you know, the tech guys that are actually doing it uh, to also not talk about it, right? A hush order in turn. Right. And that is, and that is a very common thing to do all the time. All the time. And, and it is the right thing to do. Okay. Uh, because ultimately, and this is part of Sullivan's defense, the decision about whether or not to disclose a breach will ultimately lie with the CEO advised by the general counsel. Mm-hmm. Okay. The C, uh, it's not clear that the CSO or the CISO have the authority or legal requirement to make such a disclosure. That's going to be part of his defense. I can imagine many CISOs not wanting to have to tell the CEO that they failed in something that they promised would never happen. Right. And, and you know, there are many motivations for not disclosing. There is a corporate motivation to not disclose because it's going to make us look bad. And there's a personal motivation on the part of a CISO or somebody below a CISO to either not disclose or to minimize the impact of a data breach. Yep. And so there's all this bureaucratic desire to not, to not disclose. Now, one of the things you pointed out is what is the role of the Federal Trade Commission here? Why is the FTC involved? And this is kind of a curious one because there is a federal crime, and this is one of the things that that Sullivan is charged with, of uh, obstructing a federal investigation, all right? And that includes an investigation by the Federal Trade Commission. And it applies to things like lying in a deposition, submitting false documents, submitting fraudulent documents to an investigative agency in depositions and in pleadings, things like that. What the indictment alleges is that during the scope of the investigation of the 2014 breach, it would have been relevant to the FTC to know about the 2016 breach and that therefore creates some kind of an obligation on the part of Uber in talking about the 2014 breach to tell the FTC about the 2016 breach. It makes certain statements that Uber made about the 2014 breach, like we have corrected the problem, we have better security, we are now monitoring this. We have better security, didn't say we have perfect security, and didn't say we didn't have another breach. Because it is alleged the 2016 breach exploited many of the same things that were vulnerabilities that were found in the 2014 breach, the failure to disclose, and by the way, the active concealment from the FTC of the 2016 breach, rendered the statements that Uber made and Sullivan made uh, about the 2014 breach fraudulent. Whether they were false or not, I don't know but at least they were intended to deceive the FTC. That's the basis of the second count of the indictment, which is the obstruction of justice count. Let's dig into the FTC. Um, Many people are a little perplexed that they set themselves up as the enforcer of cybersecurity best practices. Um, They seem to cherry pick uh, victims for prosecution. Um, Of course, there's, you know, hundreds of data breaches every year, but they go after particular ones, you know, Wyndham, uh, fairly famously, other sure. hotel chains, LabMD, uh, who successfully fought 
off their attempts. Um, it, you know, and I worked with the FTC back when it was um, spyware that they were after. And it was great because if you got an active spyware uh, perp, um, you could confiscate all the ill-gotten gains and that would fund your operations. I presume they didn't give it to the treasury. Um, but they wouldn't go after the real bad guys because it took five or six years to track down somebody in Russia or Eastern Europe. So they only went after U.S.-based ones. So they're cherry picking who they went after. And it certainly appears that they're doing that. I've never seen any guiding document from Congress or the president's office that gives them that authority. And we've got, you know, DHS, which is supposed to take care of things. We've got lots of uh, anti-crime, anti-fraud prosecutions from the FBI, um, drug enforcement. Why did the FTC take this on their shoulders? All right. So you, you point out a couple of interesting things about the FTC. And one other interesting thing about the FTC is the FTC primarily does not go after hackers. Right. Right. That's not their job or responsibility. So what the FTC does primarily is prosecute civilly the victims of hacking. Right. Just what they right. needed. Right. And so the FTC was started, I think, either in 1913 or 1917. I don't remember. And um, the Federal Trade Commission Act naturally says nothing about the Internet, nor does it say anything about data privacy, nor does it say anything about data security. What the Federal Trade, Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act gives the, the commission the authority to regulate unfair and deceptive trade practices. You know, what you might call snake oil. Yeah. So if you're, if you're, if you're selling a product and you, you, you remember in the movie Toy Story where um, they have the ad for, um, uh, who's the, who's the uh, spaceman? Um, Buzz, Buzz Lightyear. Lightyear. Yep. They have the, the black and white ad for Buzz Lightyear, and at the bottom of the screen it says, not a flying toy. Yep. Yep. All those kind of disclaimers that you see on ads and stuff are because of the result of FTC requirements that you not commit deceptive or unfair trade practices. The FTC obtained jurisdiction over privacy and data security uh, when companies started collecting personal data about individuals with certain promises and representations about what they would do. So a deceptive trade practice would be something like, we do not sell your information. And then they go ahead and sell it. Mm -hmm. That would be a deceptive trade practice in, 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 in commerce. Less clear is if you simply say, we take your privacy seriously. And, then, and some of the earlier cases in the FTC were of things like, we care about your privacy, we take it seriously, and then they failed to protect. And is that a unfair or deceptive trade practice? So deceptive is you promise something you don't deliver, you promise something you do something else. Unfair is just that, it feels wrong. It feels like you ought to be doing something more. So most of the data security cases come under the unfair trade practices. Uh, although there are lots of promises that companies make, we use, you know, SSL, all right? There were some early cases in which companies said, we use SSL to protect your data. And then the data was hacked from the back office. Well, mm -hmm. SSL is just a protocol for, for internet browsing. It says, it doesn't say that we are secure. That's like saying, I locked the front door. I said yeah. nothing about the windows, right? Right. But they found that to be a deceptive or unfair trade practice. So the FTC has by default, by dint of the fact that we have no general privacy law and we have no general privacy regulator, they have stepped into the, into the fold and become the general regulator of privacy and the general regulator of security. And they have lots of the powers that you talked about, the power to seize, power to forfeit, the power to sue. And, all, and the power to enforce, and more importantly, the, the power to enter into these settlement agreements. And the settlement agreements typically bind a company to do certain things for as long as 20 years after the settlement agreement is signed. That's right. typical. So the FTC, and, and, the, and the final point, of course, is that the FTC, again, is not going after the hackers. And one of the problems we have here is we look at companies like Uber or Heartland or Target or any of these other companies that have uh, failed to protect consumer data. 
as bad or evil or incompetent or whatever. And the truth is, they may be all of those things, but at the end of the day, they are victims of crimes. Mm -hmm. And we are treating them as criminals themselves. Right. And now the escalation to treat and not an officer, but a high a high level employee of a company as a criminal and prosecuting under criminal laws. Yep. And this raises the stakes for uh, data breach incident response. Uh, one of the things this demonstrates is aside from the fact that you don't pay hackers for their silence um, uh, and you don't pay hush money to hackers. And, Which is often included in ransomware payments. Well, ransomware is a little different kettle of fish, and I can talk mm -hmm. about that in a second. Okay. But aside from the fact that you don't pay, uh, pay them hush money, uh, um, is that you need to have clear and stated lines of authority about who ultimately makes the decision about whether to report or whether or not report a data breach. And as I said many times before, uh, my job as a lawyer, I have two basic rules. Rule number one is that the lawyer doesn't go to jail. And rule number two is that the client doesn't go to jail unless this conflicts with rule number one. <laughs> and as a result, you know, the, the lawyer here, uh, the general counsel, has responsibility not only to make informed and correct legal decisions. And of course, I also say about data breaches, there's... You, there's no right way to handle a data breach. Your job is to pick the least wrong way. And of course, you, know, you can now add to that. You, your job is to pick the way that will not land you or anybody else in jail. But you need to have clear lines of authority, but you also need to have openness and honesty. And that means that the lawyer handling the data breach can't simply take other people's word for what happened they need to go and independently investigate. They need to go get the log data. They need to see what happened as well. Wow. So I'm look, trying to look forward to how this is going to impact the industry because it feels like it's going to have a massive impact because CISOs are so concerned about what's going on. They're highly engaged in talking about it. Uh, uh, just talked to a group this morning that's talking about, you know, having a, their own conference call to discuss the implications um, the, you know, what's your advice to the CISOs today, other than, you know, have the reporting lines and, you know, stick to a process that you can document. Um, but isn't this going to make your career, which always hung on the balance, right? You were always the one who got shot after a breach. Uh, and then you just shuffle around to the other top yep. big companies. Um, but if you're in jail, you can't get another job very easily. Well, apparently you can. <laughs> <laughs> apparently. Um, well, obviously, you know, we haven't heard yet because Joe Sullivan is employed as a CISO now. That's um, correct. But, but we haven't heard that fallout, you know, what could happen from that, right? Well, I mean, look, the easiest way to avoid criminal charges is to not commit a crime. Mm -hmm. However, that line moves around a lot. It's not exactly like yep. there's a crisp and clear line. Um, so the, the best approach is, is to ensure that there is honesty and integrity in the whole process. Um, and that it doesn't mean you're going to make the right decision. You may decide not to report a breach that you should have reported but at least you establish that the process by which you have come to that conclusion has validity. Mm -hmm. Okay. That this is not merely covering up something that's embarrassing for you or embarrassing for the company, but that there is an informed decision about why you are and are not reporting a data breach. Um, so the, the, the best defense against getting indicted is to, generally do the right thing, or at least do things that are defensible. The second best thing to do is to make sure that the decisions that you are making are with the, the advice uh, of informed legal counsel. And I mean informed. And the third thing is, if it feels bad, smells bad, ask somebody else. Okay. You, you're absolutely right about the role of the CISO. Every CISO is one data breach away from unemployment. Yeah. Uh, and now they're one data breach away from incarceration. Mm -hmm. But it's not that they had the data breach. That's not what that's not what caused the Sullivan indictment. It is the fact that they essentially made a corporate decision, or at least Sullivan made a decision, that rather than disclose the breach, he was going to pay somebody off to not disclose it. 
So it sure sounds like it's a good time to study cyber if you're an attorney so that you can do those informed investigations for yourself. Um, there aren't very many of those in my experience. There are, there are a few. You really need to have somebody who's, who's been there before. And now, let, me, let me point out one of the subtleties here. Um, you may have a situation, and I have had this on both sides, representing companies and representing gray hat hackers, where a gray hat hacker comes to you and says, hey, I've discovered a major vulnerability in your system. If you pay me a certain amount of money, I will tell you what that vulnerability is and how to fix it. This is broadly speaking, not a formal uh, bug bounty program, but sort of what you might call an extended or informal bug bounty. From the point of view of the gray hat hacker, they are, let's assume for these purposes, not trying to extort money. They just want to be responsibly compensated for what they have found. It's a big vulnerability. They want to be, they don't want to say, if you don't pay me the money, I will exploit it. Or if you don't pay me the money, I will tell everybody about the vulnerability. They're saying, look, I don't want to tell anybody about the vulnerability. I don't want to exploit it, but I don't want to give you this for free. And you end up with this little dance between the company and the, and the hacker, you know, to try to figure out what to do. In such a circumstance, it is not unreasonable for a company to pay the gray hat hacker, not only to disclose the vulnerability to them, but also to not disclose it to the rest of the community. Right, right. Are you now paying for silence and are you now subject to criminal prosecution? Okay. And the Feels answer like to it. that is, <laughs> as I say in my articles, <laughs> Magic 8 Ball says, <laughs> ask again later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you've opened up uh, or revealed the opening of a can of worms. Really appreciate it. Mark Rash, lecturer, attorney, and cyber pioneer. Thank you, Richard.